things, um, often at the intersection of ecology and technology and um, asking questions about innovation. But that's not actually really what I, yeah, that's not the focus of tonight. Tonight I was quite inspired um, by the premise of solar punk of really talking about how we bring things into reality because that's really at the core of a lot of my projects and what I've found is that um, once things get into reality they get messy and beautiful and complicated in ways that there's actually no no way to imagine until you do it but without further ado um, I'm going to introduce the first work uh, so this is human cheese it's cheese made from human milk. Um, it's pictured in front of its urban pasture. So kind of the premise of the, of the project was, you know, in a city uh, of 8 million people, which, so this, this work was 10 years ago. I don't, I don't, I can't account for the New York City population at this time, but in a city of 8 million people and not one cow, maybe it's more kind of local and natural uh, to be eating cheese made from human milk. So this was an idea um, that I had and uh, that started actually really as a response to the rise, to kind of the two um, movements that were happening side by side in 2009, 2011, um, which is around the time that this work was happening. So in New York, it was the rise of the local food movement. Um, and I remember going to a farmer's market and uh, there being, you know, you could buy your meat from the farmer's market. And there was like a picture of the farmer with the cow taped to the table where you were buying your meat from. Um, and at the same time, there was a lot of stuff in the news um, about human women went renting their wombs, especially in poor countries to richer people that were implanting their uh, uh, eggs into into these women, and these women were bringing these babies to term. And there was like some some debate around the ethics of this, but um, mostly it was just happening, and it's still just happening. Although some countries have now uh, started to ban or at least regulate the ways in which this can happen. And so I just became really interested in how we decide. Um, which kind of human bioavailabilities we are okay with using, selling, buying, trading, eating, uh, fucking, uh, make, you know, using to make babies, and which things remain taboo and how we decide um, what that is. So that was how this, this idea came. Uh, I want to make cheese from human milk, and, um, and kind of quite, let's say, a critical, from quite a critical standpoint. But thankfully, uh, I wasn't. I really wanted to actually do it um, instead of kind of faking it or making a video or uh, making a bunch of symbols, which is sometimes in the art world one way that things happen. I, I did really want to do it. So what did I do? I went to try to see where I could get human milk, and I went to the same place I used to go get everything, which is Craigslist. Um, and I was really lucky because I think normally on Craigslist, this is not always uh, available, but just in the moment that I was trying to figure out if this is even possible, um, I found this ad. Um, so breast milk for sale, $2. $2 an ounce is actually pretty cheap, even 10 years ago. Um, so in the end, I didn't end up using the, the Craigslist source, but what I did find um, in an effort to, to get this stuff, uh, was the gray market online for human breast milk. So, uh, by go like by going, yeah, so again, by, by needing to make this real, finding this online gray market, I started to understand that there's like an entire uh, political, rich and interesting and complicated political history behind um, the selling and trading of human milk. So wet nurse is one of the oldest professions alongside with prostitution. Um, but the selling of like milk itself unattached to, to the kind of renting of the woman that's producing it uh, is pretty new. And it is this gray market because unlike human organs, which are regulated, it's definitely illegal to sell and trade. Um, in the US, which is where this project was done, 
uh, human milk is not regulated, but it's also not approved by the FDA. So it's technically, uh, you can get in trouble for selling it, um, especially like uh, within normal food establishments. But this kind of online trade is in this legal gray area. Um, and so, yeah, this is the, this is actually the screenshot from this website now. You can, it exists, you can go browse around on it. Um, as you can see by the marketing now, it's quite interesting, 10 years later, they've made it quite more wholesome. So when it first came out, there definitely was uh, and is a market among people that adopt um, kids or uh, people that can't breastfeed, that have babies for a variety of reasons, but there's also um, a pretty wide variety of other uses. So you can see here like men buying breast milk, usually kind of fetish situations. Um, I don't know that there's, yeah, there's also, they don't have a special section for it currently, but there's like bodybuilders that um, believe in the use of breast milk to help them along uh, people with different forms of cancer that are interested in the immuno properties of breast milk. So there's kind of a wide variety of reasons uh, that women are selling milk. And what is even more interesting is um, you have these women that are marketing themselves, right? And so there's really different marketing strategies that that um, the women using this website use, whether it's like, as you can see, healthy diet, no drinking, no smoking, no drugs. Um, and you can see me with my baby or like more sexualized images um, that are probably have a little bit of a different audience to all this kind of like, yeah, vegan, hyper vegan um, breast milk for sale. Uh, so I used um, this site and then actually just word of mouth to collect, uh, to buy actually uh, the milk of three different women and I used it to make three different cheeses. So one thing that I encountered along the way, um, yeah, so here's like literally the, the email exchange that I had uh, once I posted on the website that I was looking for some milk. Um, one kind of big concern that I had, because I was actually interested in uh, offering people this to eat or to see if they would eat it, um, and to like certainly have it readily available, right? Not as a, again, not as a thought experiment, but as a like smelly, cheesy, hopefully tasty substance <laughs> that was confronting them in this way that um, that proved to be uh, really powerful in shifting what people thought their reactions would be in both directions, right? Um, but one of the things was that, of course, like breast milk uh, is the one way that we can communicate human diseases. Um, so things like uh, HIV and yeah, basically any any disease that can be communicated um, through blood can usually be communicated through breast milk as well. So that became um, a really big concern. So one of the things that I actually asked for was blood tests from the women that I was buying um, milk from. So this is uh, later in an exhibition, kind of a portrait of a mother, right? So it's one, one portrait of a mother is just a readout um, of her blood test, depending on uh, what is important to you. To know about so I'm, I'm kind of interested like in in within a more art historical uh context like what does this mean as portraiture but that's um but but it came from like a very real uh problem that I really didn't want to get anyone sick um there's also of course the issue of trust and I was extra scared uh so I did double boil the milk which also just kills any disease this is what cheesemakers were really upset about because by doing that, you're killing off, of course, a lot of bacteria, um, which is kind of like the essence of what makes cheese unique and special and cheese. Um, but that was the call I made. Um, this is just like some fun um, surveys that I asked the women to fill out around like what color food they eat, why they decided to do that. Uh, yeah, like basic kind of height, weight, age, um, profession, just thinking about like what is the information that you would want to know um, about the person that you're consuming food from their body. 
Um, and of course, perhaps that raises the question of like, what is the information that you do or do not know about the other animals from whose bodies we consume food? Um, and then I, uh, I actually really try to find a cheesemaker to make this cheese because cheese making is a art of its own um, and not one that I was familiar with, but cheese makers really didn't want to touch me with a 10 foot pole because they were actually in the midst of their own political fight um, precisely around like pasteurized milk and wanting to use unpasteurized milk to make more fancy cheeses. Um, so I had to learn to make the cheese myself, which again, I think was actually uh, quite beneficial to understanding what this thing was, because I do have to be honest, you know, I was like in this project, found this milk, do, reading a lot, talking a lot to people, really clear and fine with what I was doing. And then I like had the milk and had to start, you know, sterilizing it. And the smell was uh, in the beginning, like totally nauseating. And like, that might be psychological, that might be physiological, it's probably a mix. But of course it's like super interesting um, that, yeah, again, like the, by doing it, uh, all of these ideas that I had just went out the window because I was not nauseous um, making this stuff. But the good thing is, is that I had to do it a lot. And so basically in the end, if I quite, kind of quite quickly got used to it, I stopped being nauseous, um, I got over it. Um, but of course like this, um, this boundary or something, this like biophysical reaction that I had, or maybe it was purely emotional, but like manifested physically, um, gave me a lot of food for thought around how taboos are established, how taboos get implanted in your body. Um, yeah, just things that there would not have been access to if I hadn't actually been forced to cook this stuff in my kitchen. Um, so one thing for the bio, people out there. So human milk is a little tricky. It actually does not coagulate um, as well as other mam mam mammal milk. So this is like pure human milk coagulation. So you can see it's like sticky enough that it's not running through my finger, but it doesn't, it's all like little bits and it doesn't um, coalesce into a single mass. So actually all of the cheeses I made were human cow, human goat blends, which in the beginning was kind of a compromise. Um, I really wanted it to be 100% pure and there are like possible ways to do that in that are basically just require expensive equipment like molecular sieves um, or pressure boilers. But in the end, again, uh, I actually then realized that it's almost more interesting, right? So uh, yeah, it's like places the human and the other mammal quite evenly in the same. I mean, we eat like sheep goat blend or sheep cow blend all the time, um, or even like bacon wrapped cheese, right? So uh, yeah, again, like through being forced to have to make a piece of cheese, like the, the project got even more complicated. And then of course, of course, you saw like different reactions and what people wanted to eat if they were like more drawn to the human cow or the human goat reaction. Um, the, the, the kind of project itself was also posited a little bit less in the news media, a little bit less as an artwork and more as a viable product, um, especially, you know, piggybacking off of like sustainable local circular economy kind of ideas that were just becoming popular at the moment. So this is just like the life cycle analysis of making, of me making human cheese. So you have the woman pumping the milk and then I was taking the subway to transport the milk, cooking, uh, making the cheese, using transport to distribute the cheese, eating the cheese, digesting the cheese, excreting the cheese, and then kind of looking at all the infection points at which uh, these processes affect the food, air, and water quality that the woman then consumes that then goes into her body and goes into the milk, goes into the cheese and yeah, continues in this way. So human milk is um, one of the biggest ways that um, industrial pollutants that end up in bodies uh, get expelled because the pollutants often lodge themselves inside the fat um, and yeah, milk is one of the best ways to actually like remove uh, stuff from fat. 
Um, and so there was just a question there around like, I don't know, do we begin to care more about the pollutants entering our neighbors' bodies if we are eating cheese that they make with them? But like I said in the beginning, I was really committed and interested in being able to serve this cheese um, and having people uh, come to the same maybe inflection point that I did with my initial nausea or not. Um, this work was actually, I mean, it's like one of my first works and it was initially uh, a thesis work at NYU. So it was shown in this like, um, Show, exhibition at NYU is a work in progress uh, and the lawyers uh, for NYU I mean it was like a big debate that lasted a month uh, and then in the end the lawyers said okay you can have the cheese on display but it needs to be covered in uh, like a glass um, or plexiglass container so that nobody by accident can ingest this cheese um, which of course in and of itself is like yeah totally crazy so this is uh, we we cheated a bit and took the plastic off and kind of took this photo, but this is the way that it was presented in this um, initial work in progress show. But ultimately I opened um, kind of an art exhibit, but in a low key gallery, not in a gallery neighborhood, like just a little storefront that was in between a wine shop and a bodega um, called the Lady Cheese Shop. And I was really playing with whether this was real or not. Um, and because the because it involved boobs, I think uh, it got a lot of media attention. So it was featured like in the Metro, which is the newspaper that they give out in the in the subway. Um, so it got a lot of attention, and it got a lot of attention more or less as a cheese shop, um, and not so much as an art project, which was for me uh, at the time really interesting. Um, so just briefly on the right, you see two of the different cheeses. Oh, no, those are all three of the different cheeses that we serve from the three different women. Um, so they're served with accoutrements that are inspired by the terroir of each woman. So terroir is this really um, cheesy cheese term, uh, wine term as well, of course, but it is this kind of invented um, cultural invention to naturalize certain um, uh, elements of culture. I mean, like one of the biggest ways it's used is in France for all sorts of like legal claims over be champagne being called champagne being only from a specific place. But basically the idea is that the very specific microbes, culture um, and environment of a place affects the taste of the cheese, right? So like this, this cheese can really only be produced in this tiny little village. Uh, Otherwise, it's something else. So I was interested in this idea um, and kind of played a lot with the women's biographies, where, where they were from and what they did for a living and what kind of person they were to choose which cheese I made with their milk. And also, like, what were the... So these are pickles, pickled in human way. And these are, like, cheese curds for the woman from Wisconsin. Um, and then, yeah, we had a blue cheese with a woman that really loved blue cheese and also worked with a chef. So, and like ate oatmeal cookies every day. So we had oat crackers and apple, um, apple jam. So yeah, it was this kind of also a bit playing with the um, intense foodism uh, of the moment. This is a line for the cheese shop in the East Village. Um, and then, <laughs> So dialogue, uh, I mean, like this project in particular, I was actually really interested in people's responses. Um, so dialogue became uh, a part of the work in and of itself. Um, and that happened through a number of different ways. So on top, you have the, 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 like just these really simple comment cards that I would give people at different exhibitions and tastings and things that I was doing that is really simple. Just ask two questions, like how was it and what's next? Um, so this is one of the one of the answers, um, and I just thought it was really interesting that like this person answered, you know, what's next? Mass production? Question mark? Question mark? Human farming? Um, and then I also, like I said, that this work did get a lot of news attention. Um, so this is an interview I did, like a live interview I did on Sun TV, which is kind of the Canadian version of Fox News. 
um, where they also kind of had the thing under me saying human farming, um, which, which was in some ways precisely the question that I was interested in. Um, but some other things that happened along the way that, that really surprised me, I mean, like, like I said, I started this, I think, as a really dystopic work. And like in the process, first working with these women that were really excited that I was using um, their milk, either because I was buying it, but some of them, it wasn't really for the money. They just like, you know, they pump this substance with labor from their own body um, and their baby can't consume all of it. And they like literally just can't bring themselves to throw it away. So they, you know, maybe thought it was a little weird, but um, were just like happy it was being used or like the breast milk, breastfeeding advocates that I encountered that were like super gung-ho about the whole work because they thought it was um, normalizing and making, you know, uh, making human milk more of a food than maybe uh, like this taboo um, thing. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna show one video um, that is, um, yeah, just, one of the women that I worked with. I'm 36 years old. I live in Chelsea. Um, I grew up in New Jersey. I have two kids. My daughter is two and a half and my son is eight months old. I have a pretty, uh, I eat most everything. I eat a fair amount of meat. I like a lot of vegetables. I'm not a huge fan of fruit. I love pasta, because I used to cook pasta in a restaurant, so I eat a lot of pasta. And I love cheese. That's my favorite thing. What's your favorite kind of cheese? Gorgonzola. I don't eat that many sweets except for cookies in the afternoon. I drink coffee, I drink tea, I drink water, and I drink wine. I eat meat. Um, I usually try and buy organic meat um, or like grass-fed pastured meat, which I get from my local CSA. Pumping, because I often pump when I have to, like if I have too much milk. So I compare it to like when you really have to go to the bathroom and then you finally get to go to the bathroom. Well, I was uncertain about the whole breastfeeding thing and then it came so easily to me. I have a friend who described it as, like it gave her so much confidence as a mother and you really feel like sort of accomplished. Like, look what I've done. I've fed this baby, you know, and you can see the baby's growing so much and you're not feeding it anything else. So, you know, because like you never think about your breasts that way at all until you suddenly start doing it. And then you're like, oh, well. And then it's hard to think about them in any other way once you stop. Like now I think of them these very functional sort of organs. I don't know what struck me, like what prompted me to participate rather than just read about it. I think probably just because I produce so much milk and I'm not really interested in donating it because there are so many restrictions and I'm, I don't know, I want to be able to eat what I want to eat and stuff. So, so it just seemed like a... I tend to volunteer for things, <laughs> so it's sort of in my nature. It freaks me out a little bit. Like, I definitely, that, that part of it, I'm like, that's weird. Like, who would want to do that? Cheese makers? Maybe. That doesn't bother me. Like, if people are just really into cheese and doing it as a cheese learning experience, people who are really into breast milk, that kind of freaks me out. I think the regulations that would come out of it if it became sort of a mass thing would be very disturbing because it would be regulating women and what they were doing in their own homes and what they were eating and it's just complete, you can imagine completely creepy regulations coming out of it. I don't know, it just reminds me, I took a, a really interesting class in law school about the regulation of pornography and it started to get into this whole like protecting women from themselves. And, and you can see the debate going down sort of the same path of like, what should we let women do with their bodies and not let them do with their bodies? And how much should the government be involved in that decision? 
I don't know. I don't feel like, uh, I mean, I guess you have the, the thing that like only women can do it. And typically women selling things related to their bodies has become a big ethical issue. But I think of it more as like a, like a labor rather than a commodity. And having been in a labor industry like cooking, I feel like it's not all that different. I, I feel like it's kind of the same as me sort of spending an hour making someone a pasta or something like that. So I had to spend a lot of time with that person in order to get them to talk that openly with me um, on the video. Um, and I thought it, um, I mean, I guess like, yeah, it's interesting to, to watch that now. Um, that, uh, final point, which I think is one of the most important things that I learned through this whole process, thinking about like, what if we think about human milk as a labor rather than a commodity, um, is kind of precisely everything about making it real because this like beginning idea that is dystopian and the kind of questioning position that I had around like why do we have taboos around this um, human bioproducts and not this other one? How do we negotiate and regulate that? Um, where does medicalization come in? Is kind of not the point, right? Like the point is what kind of labor does producing all of these um, bioproducts, I guess you can call them, entail, um, like physical, physiological, emotional, all sorts. And, and yeah, and that, and arriving there was only through like the step by step by step by step of actually doing this thing. Um, okay, uh, I'm gonna talk about um, another, another work um, that's a little bit quicker. Uh, yeah, so I did this um, artist residency uh, in Santa Fe Art Institute. Um, and the, the, the residency was around food justice. Um, uh, I'm just gonna, yeah, I'm gonna do a quick introduction. It was around food justice. Um, and I arrived at the residency in New Mexico. It's a state in the US. Uh, it's a state that where you can carry a concealed weapon, a gun, without a license. So as a result of that, because of insurance, um, mm, the space where I was to live and work, which is also a public um, space where they had exhibitions, um, because it was a public space, they had to put a sign on the door that said, like, no guns. Um, and I had arrived after a really long travel, quite tired, and, and uh, from a part of the country that guns are not so prevalent, um, and was just like quite freaked out by this, uh, that I was living in a place where they had to like put a sticker on the door asking people not bring guns inside. Um, but I, I, I was born in the US and have an American passport, and so uh, I guess it was my time to reckon with that. Um, and at the same time, so I was doing this food justice residency, um, and there there were people, artists working on all kinds of different things like um, food inside of jails or the TPP, the trade agreement that was going to really affect farmers in Asia, um, all, all kinds of really interesting topics, um, but all of them really thinking about justice from a human uh, point of view, justice for humans. And I really started thinking about like, what about justice uh, for the animals that we eat? Because I was at that time a meat eater. Um, and kind of struggling with it, um, but also not examining it so that I could just keep happily eating it. Um, and then, so I, I kind of took this again, like conflation of happenstance to realize that I was gonna like learn what it was to be an American <laughs> or like to be a person from the US, but to be this American um, and learn what it was to, to kill what I ate by my own hand, right? We are all, uh, if, if we consume animal products, we're all killing, just we're having somebody else do it for us. Um, and I really began this project thinking I would not, I would be able to do it because I can make myself do almost anything if it's under the guise of an art practice, no matter how much I don't want to. Um, but like thinking I would hate it and become a vegetarian. Um, but what I found along the way was something uh, 
really, really different. So uh, the, the end result of this work is an exhibition that includes, I can show quickly the slides, um, yeah, a series of, of images that are shot through with various caliber bullets um, and some other, some other works that involve kind of animal, some paintings that are shot through with bullets um, and some various other animal, animal parts um, sculptures that I can show in a bit. But um, at the core is really this film that's uh, almost 20 minutes. I won't show it here. It's called Imagine Lines and Alibis. Um, it's a film that I made uh, on the process of learning to hunt, um, hunt and kill and, and skin and butcher and cook um, two jackrabbits. Um, but I have a kind of very few minute trailer that I will share with you now. It is bloody, so just a disclaimer, I guess. Synopsis. The giant wild domesticated pig is dead, is lying by the side of Highway 40, near some oil fields and the all-you-can-eat buffet at the powwow restaurant and lounge. Different machines to kill different beings. 100% natural raccoon urine to cover your tracks. Is rabbit shit still wet? Do you notice the dirt patch where that jack rolled around? To hunt is to be twisted together with other creatures fully embedded in landscape. I don't really buy it, but I feel it. The GPS won't stop beeping. I'm klutzy and terrified. Intricate patterns in the map dictate places for living and dying. Breathe evenly and slowly to get a clean shot. Women tend to be better shots. They don't get so excited or more efficient in their calm. That pig was the only one we found in eight weeks. Had to settle for jackrabbit. You look like Laura Croft the Tomb Raider, he says. I wonder, do you envision yourself as a superhero every time you hold this semi-automatic? Or is it just my ponytail? Steady. On the reservation, kidneys are tied to branches for birds. But here on public land, we just throw the warm rabbit guts into the brush. Seven weeks of 4 a.m. starts staring and scanning out that truck window so hard my eyeballs hurt. Suddenly, all qualms go out that very same window. I just really want to kill the fucking thing. Where is a carrot when you need one? Against regulation, not fair chase. What a way to regulate bodies and species out here in the wild, or is it the great American West? Fair chase for the ethical kill. You can't prop your twenty-two on the car door for stability, but you can blow the being to smithereens with an AR-10. We have never been ambivalent towards our technologies. Just as we have always played favorite with species. It took her less than a minute to stop shaking. It felt good to butcher her. I've never wanted to eat neck meat so badly. Your predator instinct is coming out, he says. Okay. Perhaps, but that seems way too easy. Mostly I am amazed in how quickly a life turns into just another material in my hands. And what if I truly had been hungry? Um, so yeah, that's the trailer. Um, there's like a longer, slower film, but there's a lot less talking in it. Um, but I think with regards again to thinking about the theme today of getting shit, <laughs> getting real, um, shit getting real, uh, I just wanted to show, yeah, this piece with the voiceover. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to learn to hunt, um, and I didn't really know how to do it, uh, and I had never shot a gun before, so I just started, like, hanging out, actually, at the hunting store in Santa Fe, um, talking to people, um, telling them I want to learn to, to shoot guns and hunt animals, um, and just waiting around, basically, for somebody that I felt safe enough to drive into the desert with, with a bunch of guns. Um, and I found, uh, it took, it took a while, um, but eventually I did find this one man named John, um, who, you know, this was like a couple, this was a year before Trump got elected. Um, yeah. And he was, you know, I was like a artist, 
um, from New York um, with all of the ideas, you know, kind of like fully embodying that stereotype, I think in a lot of ways, never touch the gun, um, quite kind of against guns politically without really knowing too much about it or probably thinking too hard about it. Um, and he was like a Republican, had moved to New Mexico actually precisely because of the liberal gun laws and because he loves hunting. Um, and so like, uh, yeah, very politically opposed people, but we ended up spending, you know, just hours and hours and hours together, basically driving around looking for animals to kill. Um, and, you know, turned out like was one of the most generous, generous people I've encountered. Um, anyways, without like getting into the, all of the backstories, I think like some of the voiceover alludes to the very many contradictions um, within hunting animals, including like, uh, it's basically hunters that have um, been the strongest force for conservation, at least in the US, but I think uh, in many countries around the world. Um, yeah, thinking about what we, what we kill, what we are happy killing, what we are less happy killing, the ways in which we are allowed to kill. So like I said, um, in New Mexico, for example, you're not allowed to use the car door to hold up the rifle because it's considered like not fair chase, not fair to the animal. You're also not allowed to cover yourself. Uh, no, I'm sorry, you're not allowed to use um, the scent of, a, of an animal that they wanna eat to kind of call the animals out, but you are allowed to douse yourself in raccoon urine so that they can't smell you. Just like all of these fine, fine lines of how we legislate ethics and nature and, and which technology are allowed to be used um, yeah that, that are all only possible through like through going through the process but I guess the biggest thing that I'll say um, is like I said I thought I, I started this project thinking for sure I would become a vegetarian um, and hate shooting guns and what I learned is that shooting guns especially shooting big guns um, is one of the most exhilarating feelings I've ever experienced um, and I completely understand why people um, are so adamantly protective of their gun rights in the US and believe even much, much more that we really need gun control because it's really exciting to shoot big guns. Um, but also I think like the, the animal part of it, um, like really, uh, so I, I mentioned in the video, but so I had a one month art residency, but in the beginning, John refused to let us go hunting for rabbits because um, that was, like, wasn't real hunting. We had to go look for wild domesticated pigs because we couldn't shoot like rams or elk or the usual things that are hunted because you had to apply for a permit and like actually enter a lottery a year before in order to be able to do that legally. So we were like, we spent a month almost looking for wild domesticated pigs and couldn't find any to kill except for this one dead one by the road. Um, and by the time we started hunting rabbits, it turned out to be a lot harder to kill a rabbit. They're pretty fast. Um, uh, and they come out at night and you're not allowed to shoot between dusk and dawn. Um, and so the 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 artist residency actually had to extend my artist residency for another month so that I could kill something and like finish my art project. So people often say, you know, it's okay that you were killing because you were killing for food, but really I wasn't killing for food, I was killing for art, uh, which is a question all in and of itself. Um, but yeah, in the end, uh, I like um, shot these animals, skinned these animals, like skinned every little bit of these <laughs> animals, used every little bit of these animals, um, and was totally also amazed at how um, kind of similar, I guess, to the cooking of human cheese, it went from being, you know, like when I was first cutting that face off that rabbit, it was uh, pretty hardcore. Um, but slowly it's like just another sewing project, kind of like a really delicate craft. Um, and the animal turns into like skin and leather and bones and meat. Um, and I uh, became, you know, I had been reading tons of philosophy and history around 
thinking through animal rights and animals eating animals and humans eating animals and humans raising animals and, or humans eating wild animals. Um, but like in that moment doing that work, I just felt okay about it. Um, I don't know what that says exactly about me as a person, but like found my place in that situation. Um, okay, like comfortable. I stopped eating uh, store-bought meat for about five years after that and never like for five years didn't eat any meat that I didn't know who killed it um, because it was such an intimate process that it was like quite disgusting to me to walk into a supermarket and see all that packaged meat. Um, but those things also fade. Uh, so yeah, through, yeah, just again, like through doing the work, um, it all gets really, really complicated. Um, both, yeah, like the human relationships and the human, human animal relationships. Um, yeah, and then I just wanted to show, I think they were earlier. Yeah, these are just like some of the sculptural works. So this one is called Right, 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 like all spelled, I don't have the title here, but like all the three different uh, ways to spell and say, right? Like the, yeah, to write the rights and then like the rite of passage. So that's just a deer hoof that a hunter friend gave me and an astronaut pen. Um, yeah, these are some other objects and a photograph, an image, um, three little pigs. Uh, I'm just looking at the time and wondering if we want to skip the third work, because um, that's kind of a big one. And if there are any questions? Do you guys have any questions? Okay. Um, okay, I'll just do, I'll do like a real quick overview of the, one of the last things that I worked on. Uh, yeah, so I was asked to join the MIT Media Lab um, a couple years ago and kind of under the, like, upon being asked that, you know, I was asked what I want to work on before we agreed if that would happen. Um, and I said, uh, yes, awesome. I want to be a part of the Future Factory, which is like the, how the news called the, the Media Lab. I want to also make, make real futures. Um, and I want to work on thinking about how humans respond to sea level rise. Um, uh, yeah, so, and, I'm just gonna show kind of like some of the thinking and partly also like my pitch within the Media Lab for this work um, and then how the work evolved through encountering um, all kinds of harsh realities. Uh, so yeah, the pitch was like, this is, you know, a hurricane from Texas from a couple of years ago. Like uh, we all know what, what's happening and everybody lives in cities, most of them are on the coast. And like still, this is the primary solution that cities have, almost every city around the globe, other than like a little bit in Holland, they're doing some experimental stuff, but is literally to build a seawall. So like a wall against the sea, um, which is not only inevitably gonna break <laughs> eventually, but also just uh, a really problematic metaphor and a metaphor that's like encapsulates precisely the way we've related to nature for hundreds of years that have brought us to this position um, where nature uh, is causing problems for, for our way of living. Um, and I have been for many years thinking about uh, the ways in which humans and also non-humans are agents of our own evolution. Um, so uh, my proposal at the time when I arrived was um, instead of building a wall against the sea, I was interested in how humans can evolve. Like in, instead of trying to change the environment to fit our needs, we change ourselves to fit a changing environment. So how can humans um, adapt themselves in order to live in, on and under the water uh, as the water rises? Um, so when I got there. Uh, I wasn't, I had no idea what that would look like. I thought it would be like all kinds of like implants, robotics, 
crazy MIT stuff. Um, but two things happened. The first was that I really realized I was doing tons of research, like thinking a lot, writing a lot, um, talking to a lot of a lot of engineers and um, scientists about what's possible. Um, and at first, um, I, I had the idea to, to kind of come up with like a compendium of all the different possible genes of different underwater creatures that we might want to think about um, making use of for, for ourselves, like whether either directly in our bodies or for technologies that we would use, um, kind of like a shopping catalog. And then, I, and then I realized that that was, again, like precisely the wrong way to approach um, other species and natural environments in this like super extractivist, um, consumerist way. Um, and so in order to just like get myself out of that, um, because our environment does affect the way we think, I realized that I needed to go underwater. Um, so I started, I took free diving classes um, while at MIT. That was like one of the biggest um, things I learned how to do there. Um, and in doing, in doing free diving, um, you know, the first uh, lesson I went from like 15, being able to hold my breath for 15 seconds to two and a half minutes, right? In the first like four hour session, um, which is kind of incredible. Uh, and then I learned that like the, the world record for the human breath hold is 11 minutes and 54 seconds, um, well beyond what any kind of medical doctor thought was possible 20 years ago even. Um, and so I just really un began to understand um, that the capacity of the human body uh, as it is already before we start to augment and, and implant and all kinds of other things is really quite well beyond what we understand, right? So like if with breath, we are able to do so much more than we realize, what about all of the other um, traits that we have and, and how do we know like which technologies we need to add on to ourselves if we don't know uh, what we can already do with what we already have. Um, so that was kind of a big, a big thing that happened. The other thing that happened is that as I was going around the media lab, um, you know, everybody's like, oh, what are you working on? I was like, oh, I want to change people so we can figure out how to live like in and under the sea. And everyone was like, cool, like the little mermaid. Um, and I was kind of shocked by that response and was just like, no, definitely not like the little mermaid but it did get me thinking about the little mermaid um and i watched the movie again and i realized i don't want to be a little mermaid like i want to be ursula <laughs> in that story um which is how i started really thinking about octopuses um and cephalopods um so the project that came out of it uh is this training transhumanism program. So it's a it's a project for transhumanism, but we're using training as our main technology. Um, and we are evolving the future of the human, but the model for the future of the human is um, not a machine, which tends to be kind of the predominant cultural narrative, but rather a cephalopod. So not just octopuses are awesome, but also cuttlefish, um, squid, nautilus. Um, I have this image because like, I'm of course also interested in um, human and non-human relations and, and what we, so it's like kind of also a bit of a play on the idea of a model species um, and what are different ways that we can learn from other species other than um, as like very efficient uh, scientific testing uh, specimens. So a bit of a play, like, uh, yeah, this idea of the role model species um, and thinking about transhumanism in a bit of a different way. Um, this is just like a really uh, good image to, again, like think about how this thinking can, can shift, right? So like we can look at this image and we can say these people are using underwater metaphor to train for going to space, but you can also say that they're using the metaphor and dream of space to train for being underwater. Um, this image I also really love because, um, you know, uh, 
there is a certain dominant narrative that says like one of these examples is somebody more advanced and somebody less advanced. But in fact, they're just two really different approaches to being able to be underwater for a very long time, right? And they both have their um, uh, benefits and drawbacks. Um, so uh, I developed a training program um, together with dancers and engineers. Um, and after spending tons and tons of time with different cephalopods and people that raise cephalopods and study cephalopods, um, so there's like a training manual with a set of dry exercises and wet exercises. Um, there's a lexicon of this world and I'll just actually finish perfectly on time um, with a very short excerpt of, so there's like a 25 minute film that's kind of part uh, invitation to join this movement and part documentation of um, the process through which we developed and and became as cephalopod as we could get. Um, so I'll let that take us out. Oh, and just before before I do that, um, just to say that there is this <laughs> janky Tumblr website um, that kind of houses all the project, like including all the different parts. And then I we do workshops. This is like a, an ongoing an ongoing thing, and it in if you go to your urge to breathe is a lie, which is a direct quote from my freediving instructor as she's like holding my face underwater underneath the pool and my chest is convulsing. Um, but it did turn out that my urge to breathe was a lie. Uh, so if you scroll all the way down in the passwords octopus, you can watch the whole film. Um, but here's just a quick, a quick excerpt. The cephalopod has such complicated neural structures in each of its arms. It would be for us as if our fingertips had brains. Share it. I don't have anything else. Uh, strange. I mean, people have really severe reactions 
the, a lot of the work, work that I do, like especially the first two projects. Weirdly, people are much more okay with human cheese than with killing rabbits. Um, but I leave that in their camp. Um, but I think like as far as the approach itself, I mean, uh, the most interesting thing that I was told by, by someone I really respect was um, like really they were thinking about the work process itself. I mean, like I come from anthropology, geology, I'm treating research methods and that maybe then research is all that 